This is City Pulse Newsmakers, a weekly look at the issues and the people behind them in Greater Lansing. Brought to you by City Pulse, Lansing's weekly alternative newspaper. And now, here's your host, City Pulse publisher, Burl Schwartz. Good morning. One of the glories of mid-Michigan is its abundance of mid-century modern architecture. And now we have a terrific coffee table book on that very <laughs> subject. And our guest today is MSU art history professor Susan Bandes, who wrote this book. Susan, welcome to the show. Well, wow, thank you. This is quite a doorstopper. I know. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to be that big, but I kept on going. And <laughs> yeah, well, I know you uh, you uh, chronicled some, what, 130 properties in here? Yeah, and more in the footnotes. More in the footnotes? Was uh, Were there uh, things you left out? Yes, I, um, I have since learned of a few buildings that had I known about them before, I would add them. So I think of this, is, this is not a complete inventory. Hmm. There's plenty more to discover. There seems to be a lot of interest now in mid-century modern architecture. Is that simply because it's far enough in the past now that we're starting to appreciate it? I think so. We, um, it's you know, several generations since people haven't grown up with it, and their younger people are looking at it historically. Uh, but this is a phenomenon that's happening throughout the country and the world. What is it? What is the essence of mid-century modern? What what is it that captures our imagination? Well. That's a good question because I um, one of the points in the book is that it's not a monolithic style, that one th thinks of the iconic glass and steel building as the international style of modernism. But there's Frank Lloyd Wright working at the same time on a very different scale and his prairie style um, influenced Oh, many cities uh, around the country. So I think what to me is the essence of modernism is the looking forward as opposed to looking back. So not a, a historical um, perspective or point of view and also the use of new materials. So things like prefabricated materials, steel, big windows, that's all um, you can find throughout all the modernist trends. Well, how did you get interested in it? Uh, good question. Um, I, I think of myself as an architectural tourist. You know, I'd, I'm much more apt to go to a city than to a beach resort on a vacation. So I, I've, since growing up in Manhattan, I've had an interest in architecture. Um, but more recently, when I moved to Michigan, well, it's not so recently. <laughs> um, in the mid '80s, I kind of looked around and I thought, "Hmm, where's the interesting architecture?" And I heard about Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings. Uh, and in 1990, for the 50th anniversary of the Get Schwinkler House by Frank Lloyd Wright, um, and I was director of the Kresge Art Museum at that point. Um, I borrowed all of the original drawings from Talies and the Wright archive and did an exhibition and uh, a subsequent publication. Um, so there was a hiatus in my interest in architecture while I was off teaching 17th century um, Baroque <laughs> and running the Kresge Art Museum and doing all sorts of other exhibitions. And then in about 2012, um, I was asked to meet with the staff of the State Historic Preservation Office. They were just starting their project of Michigan Modern. Uh, and the director and several staff people had been out to California. Um, and they heard the Californians claiming kind of the birth of modernism. And the people they talked about were the Ameses. Well, they went to school at Cranbrook and other important Charles people like that. Ames. Charles and Ray Ames. So the Michigan people came back and said, there's a story that we have to tell and kind of reclaim our um, sort of origins or origination of the modernist style. And 
when I met with them in 2012, this project was already underway. They have a wonderful website where they were inventorying buildings. But they were starting to think about an exhibition um, at the Cranbrook Art Museum. And because I had done so many exhibitions, we were just kind of brainstorming about how you do exhibitions, um, what approach do you take. And I came away from that meeting thinking, this is way too interesting. How can I get involved? This is a long story yeah. to tell you my, my involvement and my interest in it. Um, I ended up teaching a, an art history upper level class um, the following semester. And the student's task was to inventory East Lansing Modern. Mm -hmm. At which point I realized that there were no obvious resources, names of architects had disappeared, uh, and I had to help the students find a lot of the archival information and primary um, material. And I ended up doing a small exhibition for the MSU Museum on East Lansing Modern. And then I realized if I didn't do a publication, this would all disappear again. So then in thinking about the publication, I wanted to include Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, that expanded to Okemos and Lansing City Hall. That expanded to Lansing. So East Lansing became mid-Michigan modern. Hmm. Well, it, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, if people know anything about uh, mid-century modern architecture, they know Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, but uh, th who's Gogi, or what is Gogi? <laughs> what, is, what is Googie? That's Googie, a good question. Right, yeah. um, <laughs> there was a Googie Diner in Los Angeles, mm. and it was the first to have a, like a zigzag roof. and to call attention to itself. So this is a time when the automobile culture is developing, you know, everybody's whizzing by a street at 50 miles an hour. And the in order to make people stop and come in, you, know, you started to get these roadside attractions. So you could think of a hot dog stand that looks like a hot dog. Right. Um, and so from the Googie Diner, the name or the term just expanded and kind of move from the West Coast to the East Coast. So what, what, as you've done your research and now your book, what surprised you the most about our local modernist architecture? What surprised me was how much of it there is and how many really fine architects were in the area whose um, buildings are still there, but the names have been disconnected with them, except amongst a small set of architectural aficionados. So rediscovering the work of the regional architects um, and uh, just the variety in which they worked. That was one of the surprises. Mm -hmm. Second surprise is I always think of this area as fairly flat and not much in terms of differences in terrain or topography. But a lot of the residences ended up being on near rivers. Uh, and you get a front that's maybe one story, very modest on the street side. And on the back of the house, it'll be two stories with fabulous walls of windows hmm. looking out on the rivers, the Red Cedar, Grand River. So Tecumseh River Drive right. is a good example. So that that I wasn't expecting either because I always thought of the houses as I drove by the front. Mm. So those were surprises. Uh, you know, we hear occasionally about uh, the possibility of some examples of this style architecture being torn down. Uh, you know, the, they were looking at tearing down the building uh, in East Lansing, currently occupied by a Big B, used to be an Arby's, I believe. And right. uh, there was even talk uh, about tearing down the Capitol area, district libraries, downtown headquarters. Uh, have we lost much? We, we've lost a lot of the Googie mm. examples. Um, and the example of the Big B or Arby's, um, that's a wonderful building, but it was not built to last in the same way of right. that stone construction does. Uh, so I think there it's an issue of the aging of the building, but hopefully it 
has not disappeared yet. But there, I mean, uh, I know you're not an architect, but it seems like it could be saved. <laughs> There's got to be a way to to save that cons construction. Yeah, yeah. and there, there's a wonderful example on Michigan Avenue. Um, it was a prairie-style bank, one-story bank, and there's a brewery that's building behind right it. Right by City Pulse. Yeah, yes. I mean that. I was my heart was jumping when I when I realized what was happening there that they've actually saved, saved that it. building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is good news. Well, uh, the the, uh, uh, the modernist architecture in mid Michigan must relate in some way. It's we're not, you know, we're not an island. How does it relate to modernism across the country? Well, it it's very much what was happening across the country, and I try to put Mid Michigan in that context in the book. Um, in the, well, I'll give a couple of examples. The Lansing City Hall and Police Headquarters Building, mm -hmm. when it was being um, designed and thought about. There were articles in the Lansing State Journal, in one case, compared um, the design to the United Nations, which had just opened in New York. And in a second article a couple of years later, it was compared to Lever House. Well, these are iconic, international style, steel, glass um, buildings in New York. Um, it turns out that you know, the mayor, Crico, at that point, um, you know, deliberately picked those styles to project how forward thinking the government was. Hmm. So here we have Lansing creating this Lever House type international style building. Well, so was Detroit for their city county building. Uh, about five years later, so was Grand Rapids. So it was a kind of trope that was used by city governments to project a particular image. And uh, does it still project the future, do you think? I, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I, I've come to really admire Lansing City Hall, the building, um, and uh, I think it maybe needs a little updating or cleaning, but it's, it's really a spectacular building with the um, front on that pedestrian mall, which is okay. kind of related to the Lever House and United Nations, so that that humanizes the structure behind it. And, and the, this current administration is hoping to sell it, uh, but uh, there's no talk of losing that building, but what, what, what do you do with a building like that? I mean, uh, they say that, uh, uh, that one of the reasons they want to sell it is that it truly is uh, in need of uh, major uh, uh, res restoration. And uh, uh, but, uh, what, what kind of use could you foresee for that building? Is it just offices? Could it be a hotel? And oh, a hotel. Well, <laughs> there have been offices in our recent history, the last couple of months, that have opened in what used to be former office buildings. Yeah. Um, so that could work, mm -hmm. I would assume. But, you know, buildings like people need attention. And uh, everything needs to be modernized and upgraded. And you right. can't just build a building and assume that it's going to just exist. It yeah. needs care and attention. A and unfortunately, uh, th in these difficult uh, times economically, the building probably, uh, uh, just like the parks, haven't gotten the attention they, uh, they need. Uh, uh, the uh, location of a downtown is very important, and the contrast with the capital I is wonderful, I think. And, uh, and we're, uh, you know, yeah. we'll have, but when the show airs, we'll just have had another Silver Bells. I hope people will look <laughs> you know, yeah. and appreciate yeah. that building. And, and location was really um, key when that building was built because the original city hall was a block to the north. And Mayor Crego made a conscious decision to move it to the south, mm. opposite the Capitol, 
you know, to really anchor the city yeah. and to send a message about city government. You know, one, one of the, th you're bringing up the old capital, though, does make me think about how we don't necessarily recognize in uh, at the right time how important it is to preserve. I mean, I've seen postcards of the old capital, and you know, I was thinking it's like, gee, it was would, could have been like the water tower in Chicago, you know, if we had held on to it. And uh, are you concerned uh, that we're going to destroy some of our uh, glorious mid-modern architecture? Yes, and we've already lost things like the old convention center. Um, I'm hoping that this book's book makes people look around a mm -hmm. little bit more and sort of stop and really look at buildings and appreciate them. Uh, if you think about what the city would have looked like before 496 was put in, you know, it was full of beautiful old, older homes from turn of the century, right. and most of those are gone. So I, I don't think that Lansing has very been a very good um, preserver of our architectural heritage. Yeah, and it's, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to ownership, and unfortunately, for example, the prime example of uh, a. George Nelson design in downtown Wa uh, Lansing on Washington Square. Uh, the owner uh, has refused a number of offers that he thinks would have not been suitable. Mm -hmm. uh, un unfortunately, now the building sits lar uh, empty and has been for years. But I think, you know, a lot of it is somebody saying no. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and now. Um, you know, to get on the historic register, a building has to be 50 years or older. And that's been an issue for modernist buildings because they weren't old enough to get on the register, mm -hmm. which really brings attention to the building. Um, so those rules are changing a, um, a bit. And, you know, the further away we are, the more interesting the past looks to me, mm -hmm. at least his, in terms of our architectural heritage. Um, so we'll see, but you know the State Historic Preservation Office has a big move to preserve Michigan Modern. It's happening across the country. I'm involved with an international organization with a strange name of Docomomo, hmm. um, but it's based in Paris and it's involved with the preservation of the modernist heritage, whether it's buildings or uh, landscapes. And we had the international conference in Detroit in September. So there's greater interest now than even three or four years ago in um, looking around us at this mid-century um, period. Well, uh, fortunately, the Eide family has saved and restored the facade and much of the interior of the old Knapp's department store downtown. But that that's not mid-century modern, is it? No, that's a little early. But I do mention it in the mm -hmm. book because it's such an iconic building and so, so important, and it was so forward-thinking. The um, interesting thing about the placement of the Lansing Public Library was uh, it was specifically at the sort of edge of the downtown shopping district near Knapps, and there were two other department stores downtown. And the library sort of positioned themselves there so they could take advantage of the pedestrian walking around, stopping and shopping, yeah. and you know, going into the library. Unfortunately, that's not the case now. Uh, it, it, architects who've worked in our area, I mean, we, you know, everybody knows of Frank Lloyd Wright, but who are some of, uh, who are some local architects uh, or, or, or architects who, other architects who've worked in the area? Yeah, in well, area? well, I, I discovered um, the local firms, but also more regional architects and internationally known architects. Um, for example, there, is, there was a firm of Keck and Keck. They were um, brothers based in Chicago. 
they became very well known because of this very futuristic house they did that was one of the temporary buildings at the Century of Progress World's Fair, 1933. And uh, they were particularly known for their passive solar systems and ventil innovative ventilation systems. There are actually two houses by Keck and Keck that were designed for our area. And by working in his papers, which are in Wisconsin, I discovered one house that was not built. It was supposed to be in East Lansing on Harrison um, and the corner of Northwind. And I went to the property and there's nothing there. So it was never built. Hmm. Um, but the gentleman who was a professor from MSU who contracted with Keck and Keck had lots of letters back and forth. There are drawings of what the ho house was going to look like. No windows opened in it, but it was ventilated by louvers that you opened. Huh. And there were s steep awnings that shielded the big thermopane new material at that point. Um, the thermopane windows from the sun. Uh, and then in the winter, you didn't get deep shadows and you know it, the house heated up. Um, this professor, Donald Hayworth, um, wanted to open the house to people in the area as a demonstration of what could be done using the latest technology. Uh, the unfortunate thing was he was going to use money from him, his life insurance policy to pay the fees that he needed to build the house, and it was nowhere near enough. So that project just ended. But there is a second Keck and Keck design, one that was built that's right next to the two, uh, two of the four Frank Lloyd Wright houses. So I had no idea about that first drawing. I also discovered houses that Frank Lloyd Wright had designed for families in the area that weren't built. So total, he designed 12 houses, of which four were built. Hmm. So those are the international architects. Um, Hugh Stubbins from Massachusetts was the designer of the Lantern Hill um, subdivision. Uh, he went on to design City Corps in New York and embassies all over the world. This was um, a project at the very beginning of his career. Uh, other um, architects whose work shows up here uh, include Alden B. Dow, who I think is a hero to Michiganders especially if you go to visit Midland and see his home and studio, which is spectacular. Mm. But in fact, he's not very well known outside of the Midwest because most of his work was here. He deserves to be far better known, and the houses and the one church that he did here um, are really quite wonderful. So well, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is endlessly fascinating, and I, I want to share a story you may or may not know, uh, told uh, to me by uh, a docent at the Greek Orthodox Church in uh, Milwaukee that Frank Lloyd Wright designed, and he said he was part of the group that met with Wright uh, when they uh, engaged him to design the church, and they all told him, uh, they were sitting around having coffee and they told him what they'd like and then when, when the, they stopped talking, Wright took his empty coffee cup, turned it upside down and said, this is your church. <laughs> and, and then the follow-up to that was that uh, th they said, well, you have to put a cross on top. Every Greek Orthodox church has a cross. He had no plans when he uh, turned in the designs to them for a cross. And the archbishop in Chicago uh, asked him to come and meet with them. So he ended up uh, putting a cross in, embedded in the top of it uh, with stained glass, so it gives this wonderful light, but he would not yield. And I, I don't know how common that was among these groundbreaking architects, but. Well, I think Frank Lloyd Wright was a, a force unto himself. 
And in the book, I actually do a comparison between the project that he was going to do in East Lansing for a group of faculty members in 1939-40 that ended up being called Usonia One. Hmm. And it was a um, community of seven different houses with a f communal farm in the center. Each of the members of this group contracted with Wright separately, wrote letters to him, and explained what it was that they wanted um, in their house. And he designed very distinctive houses for each one of them. Of course, they were all over budget, and there are many letters back and forth, you know, questioning his materials. I mean, you just didn't question him. You didn't. Poor Erling Brauner, who was over six feet tall, complained about the height of the door frame, and right, you know, basically told him stoop. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's all of that that happened, um, and only one of those houses, the Getschwinkler, was built on a separate property. Then, uh, about ten years later, we have the Lantern Hill project, and there it was um, a group of some. 41 faculty members who bought land. They had bylaws and covenants. They all agreed to go to one architect, Hugh Stubbins, who gave one, gave three designs. Each person could pick amongst the three. Almost everybody picked the one. And they all built at the same time. They could make some modifications. They could add a room or not. Um, and Hugh Stubbins was very young. He, as I said, gave them what they wanted, and that project happened within about six months. So I make a comparison and try to figure out why did this one work and that one didn't. And I think basically it came down to the ego of the architect hmm. and the desire to build separate buildings for each and the Hugh Stubbins Lantern Hell project where everybody kind of got the same design. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> yes, but it's a wonderful book. Uh, I, you know, I can't uh, tell you what to buy people for Christmas, but uh, this, uh, this uh, would be a handsome uh, present to find under the tree. And it's written by our very own Susan Bandies from MSU. And Susan, I wish you well with this and, uh, and very you. happy holidays to you. Thank you. You too. And we will be back uh, with a new show in, uh, the f in the beginning of December. Meanwhile, have a great Thanksgiving and post-Thanksgiving. See you then.